Well, as uh, many of you know, we have been looking at grizzly bear populations uh, in Alberta over the last number of years. Currently, grizzly bears are listed as a threatened species in our province. And um, it was, I, I think, last year that uh, one survey uh, that was over done over many years along the eastern slopes was completed by Gord Stenhouse and... Um, he came up with sort of a, a definitive number of grizzly bears, but there's a big part of our province that we have no idea, maybe until now, um, of the number of grizzly bears. The northwest uh, part of Alberta has sort of been a, an enigma, and that is until my next guest uh, started to do some work with a team of biologists and a number of key partners. A real pleasure to welcome um, Dr. Courtney Hughes to the program. Uh, Courtney, so great to see you again. It's been a long time. Um, tell us a little bit about the Grizzly Project that you and, and others have been working on in that part of uh, our province. Yeah, thanks very much, Mike. It's been, it's great to see you and it's great to be back and uh, sharing about the project. Um, kind of at a high level, this project was um, a, a bit of a long time coming based on different uh, staff with uh, the department uh, coordinating different meetings and engagements with um, folks that worked on the, across the landscape up in the Northwest. So, you know, whether that's um, the petroleum industry, the forestry industry, different agricultural landowners, uh, as far back as 2011. And then, um, you know, those conversations kind of gave insight into, you know, we have grizzly bears, we potentially have some conflict to mitigate or some interest in understanding grizzly bear population uh, insofar as the recovery plan is, is um, concerned and what that means for operations on the landscape and, and conservation of grizzly bears. And then uh, there were some efforts done to try and test the efficacy of the different DNA based um, so bear hair collection uh, up in our country, in the peace country, just given um, you know the, the number of daylight hours we have that might uh, affect the hair quality samples, the landscape um, uh, expanse, so a big geographic area over roughly 40,000 square kilometers to collect this hair. And, um, you know, it's in, in a tough to access landscape as well for some, uh, some portions. And so this kind of, all of these things kind of gel together to become the impetus to form a multi-stakeholder collaborative working group um, more formally called the Northwest Grizzly Bear Team. And from there, we, um, you know, had many different discussions to identify the ongoing data gaps, uh, largely which resulted around the, the population estimate for bear management area one, and then what to do about it. So how do we, how do we fill this data gap and how can we do that working together? So I, I guess let's, let's start with the obvious question. What did the study reveal in terms of grizzly bear population in that area? Yeah, so, well, over the period of, of um, our, our sampling period, we collected, uh, and so that was between May and, and July of 2017, uh, we collected um, roughly 4,200, so 4,200 uh, hair, different hair samples um, across the study grid that we had uh, in, the, in the area. Uh, and, and from that, what we detected uh, based on top performing model estimates was within the recovery zone. So the, the grizzly bear management area is both recovery zone and support zone. So we sampled the recovery zone only. Uh, and within the recovery zone, we had about 0.7 grizzly bears per thousand square kilometers, or roughly within that area, a range of, or, or sorry, uh, uh, an absolute grizzly bear abundance, or sorry, expected grizzly bear abundance of 16, roughly 16 grizzly bears in the area. So not a high density or, or less than what we expected, I think. I guess that's my next question. Was that a surprise to you in terms of given that that vast of an area, um, so low number? I mean, a, a little bit, um, but really not far off from what uh, Gordon Stenhouse and Foothills Research Institute had um, estimated based on other modeling um, historically. Uh, you know, and I think it's, we have to take into consideration the habitat that we have up north, so it's a uh, boreal uh, forest, we've got muskeg, it, it's probably marginal habitat for grizzly bears, um, you know, uh, probably better habitat for black bears and, and other uh, wildlife species. Um, and so a little surprising, but not that surprising. We also have, you know, a fair amount of um, 
historic and, and other uh, footprint, anthropogenic footprint in the area that has invariably contributed to, to historic conflict. And so, um, you know, again, not super surprised, but, um, you know, a little, a little shocking. In turn, it's interesting, I think, Courtney, we, we tend to focus, I think, a lot on habitat, what, what's good for the animals, how do we um, ensure that it, it, it's protected and grows. But I think with this, uh, there's an, uh, an equally important stream, and that is the social response, the attitude towards bears. Um, does it differ in in the study zone that you looked at compared to how our attitudes towards bear may be further south? That's a great question. And I definitely agree there's a huge social component, uh, social, cultural, and of course, economic, uh, political decisions are all kind of um, captured in that big social bubble. Um, and I would say, yes, you know, people's experiences uh, culturally, historically, currently vary. And all of those experiences do impact, you know, the acute kind of proximate attitudes people would have, which do translate to behaviors. Um, and they do differ based on the context uh, geographically uh, across the province. But I'd also say within different subgroups based on, you know, are, are you a landowner thinking about going out and checking your cattle? Uh, and if it's calving season, you know, at, at four in the morning, potentially heightened risk compared to, you know, someone who might be going out for a hike and they can prepare for a bear encounter in a little bit of a different way. Um, so, you know, and I think that it does vary across the province. Um, and we just have to take that in, into consideration when we're working with different folks. You know, how are they showing up that day? What's their um, perceptions, experiences, values for grizzly bears and, uh, and how they interact with them on the landscape? Invariably, uh, through my PhD work, most folks like grizzly bears. Generally, that kind of statement holds true, but it depends. It depends on what that situation is, and, and that can be, that's quite understandable. So going forward, uh, what is this study um, allowing, I guess, uh, wildlife managers, land managers, uh, industry, uh, information is power. And um, having this kind of, um, I guess, a, a baseline, I mean, this is, this is obviously something that was needed so that uh, when a study like this is done in the future, uh, there is um, something to compare it to. Uh, it, are there tangible actions that are going to come out of this or is is this uh, sort of a okay good to know and and we'll come back and revisit it in x number of years yeah i mean part of our work was um not only to address the the data gaps and and first and foremost was the population inventory which we completed uh which does help um identify different objectives to address you know the limiting factors to grizzly bears so again those mortality risk um factors uh, the habitat components, um, particularly related to access management, which is also good for, uh, you know, a multi-species consideration or even the, the ecosystem um, overall. And I think there's also, you know, what came out of this was exploring other innovative ways to address, um, you know, human bear coexistence. Um, and so, you know, we had the Grizz Tracker Citizen Science Program. Uh, it's still running. I, in fact, had a few different registrations this week. So as bears uh, emerge from their dens, they're more active, folks start registering for the, the smartphone app and then using it to some extent, which is excellent. Um, and so that's still really helpful. And then locally, you know, the, the education outreach piece is, I, I maintain is always important, um, especially when bears become top of mind in the spring. And then as we go through the summer and into fall, you know, folks are asking for, well, how do I use bear spray? Which is a great question uh, because it means they're carrying it or they're interested in carrying it and, and being prepared in bear country. Um, and more and more folks are trying to, you know, get their kids involved. So there's bear awareness from younger generations. And I think that's really important for, you know, local strategies to address the conflict, because the more we can, um, you know, take positive action on our end, the more we can stay safe and ultimately, you know, try and keep bears wild and alive. I, that's a great point about the the grizzly tracker. I mean, that it, it's a wonderful tool and it's become something of a, a citizen science project, hasn't it? Yes, correct. Yeah, we did. Uh, we have a couple papers. One was recently published where we evaluated the program uh, and, and how it worked 
from program design with the Northwest Grizzly Bear team all the way through to implementation and, and ongoing use. Uh, and through that paper and our evaluation, we identify you know, what worked and importantly, what didn't and what we learned from that because we can learn from where things don't go so well. Um, and that's been really helpful for you know, the discussions on how do we continue to enhance this project or this program and, and keep it alive and keep it going for the intent of informing uh, bear management um, in the future, because that was ultimately the intent, uh, you know, alongside the education component for folks. Um, and then the, the other paper we're working on is really looking at the effectiveness of the tool itself. So, um, you know, how many folks were using it, what were their motivations, uh, that social side, but also the utility of, could we use this to, um, you know, trigger safety alerts for, for folks working in bear country, uh, because we have increased sightings, and how would that work? So, that's forthcoming as well. Well, some fascinating work and uh, we really appreciate your time today to bring us up to speed on it and look forward to chatting with you, not only about grizzly bears, Courtney, but uh, I, I know you're busy with a number of other projects and hopefully we get an opportunity to get out in the field and, and uh, see, uh, see the work that you're doing. Yes, you bet. I'd love to have you here in Grand Cache out in the Wilmore. Perfect. <laughs>